Thank you so much, Yvette. Uh, it's it's great uh, that you gave us this opportunity to share about this important resource, uh, not just for NCI, but for all of Indian country, honestly. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to start off before I turn it over to Kobe, uh, we're going to be ping ponging back and forth during this presentation, but I wanted to start off talking about uh, where this database uh, came from, why we felt compelled to create it, uh, and, and how we're using it. Uh, so um, just in a nutshell, this, uh, what we call the National School Mascot Tracking Database, uh, is a national database uh, that identifies sorts and catalogs uh, the nearly 2,000 uh, public uh, K-12 schools in all 50 states that have some form of native theme mascot, as well as those um, private K-12 schools that we were able to identify or those that are brought to our attention by uh, concerned local citizens in a particular community. Um, we don't pretend this to be a perfect database. We are certain that we uh, have missed and will continue to miss a school here or there. Um, but we are confident that this is uh, the most comprehensive and updated uh, national accounting of the extent, the location, and the types of native themed school mascots in the country. Um, and as my, as my colleague, Kobe Clark, will soon explain, we go to great lengths to ensure that this database provides the most accurate picture of these mascots in real time. Um, what are they? Where are they? Are they being uh, discussed in terms of potential retirement and so forth? So why was this developed? Um, as many of you know, uh, NCAI has been, has been helping uh, to lead any country's movement to uh, eradicate offensive native theme mascots uh, from sports and popular culture for more than five decades now. And a central part of NCAI's Ending Indian Mascots Initiative is really about education. It's about educating America about the harms these mascots cause, and specifically, um, how the dehumanizing stereotypes that these mascots perpetuate directly, and this is important, they directly foster unwelcoming learning environments that discourage academic achievement by Native youth, and they also lead to bad policy that negatively impacts tribal sovereignty and tribal communities, and there's growing research that really draws, uh, illuminates the cause and effect relationship between the stereotypes that are embedded in these mascots and, um, and educational attainment among Native youth, among you know, uh, bad policy at the local, state, and national levels. Um, our initiative currently focuses on uh, three primary levels. Uh, it's the K-12 school level, as I mentioned. We also are doing increasing work at the state level and then also at the professional sports level. Um, we are currently heavily engaged with stakeholders across all three of these levels. Uh, from working closely with uh, Major League Baseball's Cleveland franchise uh, to change its mascot, uh, to, to engaging and educating um, state legislatures uh, to develop and advance legislation that bans race-based mascots among the public schools in their states. At the K-12 level, uh, over the past few years, even before uh, last year's murder of George Floyd and, and other events that, that fixed the nation's attention on racial equity and justice, uh, we witnessed a significant uptick in the frequency and the intensity of debates in local school communities about whether their mascots should be retired. But uh, what we lacked was a tool to effectively, efficiently, and proactively engage with these schools uh, to educate school leadership, students, and parents about the well-documented harms that their mascots cause native people, about Indian country's long-standing opposition uh, to these mascots, and how other schools and sports teams have successfully retired their mascots in favor of mascots unrelated and unconnected to native people in any way. And, and with that, uh, next slide, and I'll turn it over to my colleague, Kobe Clark. Thank you, Ian. Uh, so, so how is the database built? There were existing lists, existing databases that uh, purport to, to include all native theme mascots used across the country. Um, and we used those lists to sort of kickstart our database, but quickly realized that the information included was um, not only incomplete, but, but very outdated. Um, it was often missing schools and missing information 
about those schools and also included schools that had already retired mascots uh, years prior. So we conducted extensive research uh, to update the status of each of those schools individually. Um, so for the example included here, we may have, we used Google research uh, to, to search, uh, especially the news articles. So for example, we may have used Paw Paw High School, uh, Michigan, mascot discussion, uh, mascot controversy, mascot issue, um, any other sort of search terms to try to gather as much information, relevant information as we could, um, and then enter it into the database uh, in, the, in the columns that we used. We also quickly uh, realized the importance of gathering relevant contact information uh, for school leadership and school district leadership, such that we could uh, inform them of uh, NCAI's opposition to the mascots, Indian country's opposition to the mascots, and uh, of course, the harms that these mascots cause. Uh, we also um, were able to gather important information about local allies through news coverage and through various petitions that were circulating in communities, uh, pushing for mascot changes in their respective uh, districts. We also, as you can see in that final column there in the bottom row, gathered mas all mascot images uh, and then sorted them by mascot. We also gathered any other images that were relevant, including uh, murals uh, or signage, perhaps um, the turf on the football field, uh, maybe the paint on the basketball court, uh, et cetera. And then also important pictures for um, fan rituals or fan behavior as well. Next slide, please. Looks like it's up there. Um, so how is this database maintained? Uh, so, so realizing the importance of, of the Google searches that we were conducting, uh, we established a weekly set of Google alerts um, some of them are included here, Indians mascot, um, R word mascot, native mascot, uh, school mascot change, et cetera. And, and those come in weekly. And we have another teammate, uh, Ashley Hamilton, who does a great job of digesting all of that information and putting it into a Word document uh, for each of us, each, uh, both Ian and I, um, so that we can update the database weekly and, and make sure that we're up to date in real time with all of the relevant information as these discussions evolve um, and or begin. We also receive frequent uh, requests for assistance from students and or concerned community members um, who can inform us of ongoing dynamics and, and latest developments, especially those that may not necessarily receive local news coverage. Um, and we're also continuing to uh, speak with um, school leadership and school board leadership uh, at schools that are still discussing the issue and at schools that have already retired their mascots uh, to keep us informed of, of how that process is going and, and evolving over time. Uh, and of course, we're also always hoping to, to grow our coalition of local allies and have recently developed a, a new email specifically for mascots that, that Ian will touch on uh, on a later slide. Next slide, please. Thank you, Kobe. So how does NCA leverage the database? And I'll, I'll get into the content of the slide. I did want to, I did, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about how, how we built this and, and Kobe's uh, incredible commitment to make, making this happen. He, he came on with NCI about two years ago as an intern. And I said, you know, we've been needing to create this tool for quite a long time now, and this is going to be your job. And I hope you don't mind tedious work because this uh, recon, you know, constructing this, database of 2,000 schools from across the country is going to be incredibly tedious, but once it's done, it's going to be incredibly uh, powerful and, and valuable to the organization, as well as other stakeholders across the country. And so uh, kudos to you, uh, Kobe, and also to Ashley for helping us maintain it. It is, it is a, um, a regular part of our daily work, and it's, uh, it's something that's proven incredibly invaluable to the organization. You know, the database has, just in the past year that it's been operational, really come to serve as a as a springboard for, for deep, sustained, and impactful engagement with, with uh, local school communities. And to bring to them a level of accurate education about tribal nations and peoples where it often has not existed to date in any you know, meaningful or accurate way. And in terms of 
uh, the database driven engagement with a particular school, it, it typically commences in one of two ways. Often what will, what will happen is we'll receive a request for assistance from a concerned local school community member. This can be a, a parent, this can be a student, uh, it can be a, a you know a, an alumni. We, we've in particular seen a lot of recent alumni, so people who are in their late teens, early twenties, um, who are you know who just you know I guess you could say, you could say have recently become woke to these kinds of issues, and you know uh, are in some ways ashamed that they went to a school and graduated from a school that has a, a mascot that dishonors Native people in this way, and so when that happens. Uh, we immediately, what we do, pull that school from the database, um, and that includes that contact information for all of the key players within the school community, the school board members, the school principal, often the athletic director, um, any, other, um, any other stakeholders that we've identified, and we send them um, a standard informational packet that includes um, NCI's resolutions, our many resolutions in opposition to these mascots, um, the, the research that NCI and others have done in this area that, that talk about and document and um, bring data into the conversation about the impacts that these mascots cause, particularly uh, uh, Native youth and their self-esteem. And that usually um, leads to a deeper engagement. The other way um, that we uh, deploy the database is, um, you know, Kobe mentioned that on a weekly basis, um, we have this Google alert uh, web, if you will, that returns all of these results to our team, um, that often will illuminate a new school, um, for our purposes, a new school that we haven't identified as being active in terms of deliberating uh, whether to retire its mascot. And so when we, when we identify a school that we have not yet engaged and we, have, we confirm that they are, in fact, engaging this issue, we pull that school and we do the same. Um, typically, when we do one of one or both of those things, um, this information will then lead to some sort of response from one of the recipients of that uh, uh, educational informational resource email um, requesting additional information. They might request to meet with NCI staff sort of behind the scenes, or they'll ask us, uh, you know, representative of the organization to come testify publicly at a school board meeting. Uh, uh, First Vice President Payment, um, knows all about this because he is one of the NCAI tribal leaders um, uh, and staff that is uh, regularly asked to come testify and explain uh, the harms that these mascots cause and NCI's position on the subject at these school board meetings. And some schools even go to the lengths of, of scheduling special standalone school board meetings just to hear from NCAI. Uh, my colleague Yana Allen and I uh, did one such meeting just about a month ago. Um, all school contacts in the database, importantly, also are added to NCAI's mascots email listserv. And Kobe and Ashley, every two to three weeks, um, as developments warrant, um, they will send out a new uh, mascots broadcast to this uh, targeted audience. And among other things, uh, what this broadcast will do is it will um, illustrate and celebrate those schools that have decided to retire their native theme mascots. So our tone is very much one of, we want to educate and we want to celebrate those who are willing to learn and come to a learned decision about these mascots. We are not there to shame um, schools to, you know, call folks racist um, because that will shut them down and they will not want to continue to engage with us. We want to start a dialogue through which we can deepen the relationship and continue to educate. And we found that that has really uh, powerful results. So next slide. So just a, a quick look at, at some of the numbers here in the database. Um, as you can see, still, still, even with all the progress made in the last few years, still more than a thousand school districts employing these native theme mascots across the country. Those districts represent, uh, as you can see here, nearly 1900 schools. Um, and, and actually, these, all of these districts, all of these schools are accounted for. Uh, we, we are aware of their existence. But as Ian mentioned previously, there are some schools that slipped through the cracks that weren't in previous databases and haven't or had not yet shown up in our searches, uh, especially private schools or uh, some of the smaller rural districts. Uh, in fact, recently, earlier this week, doing a state-level poll, we found a, another Red Raiders mascot that we were unaware of. 
Um, and so that total number of, of schools is actually now just barely eclipsed 1900 um, again. And, and just a couple of examples here of some of the mascots and a couple more on uh, the next slide. So next slide, please. So a couple more of the mascots. Um, this does not account for all of the, the mascots in the database. So, so don't expect the totals to, to necessarily equal the overall total. Um, we have excluded here um, Red Men, Red Raiders, um, a couple of other mascots, and also any of the miscellaneous names, um, some named after local tribal communities, um, some say tomahawks or, or arrows as well are also included. Uh, in the current numbers and in the in the database total. Uh, next slide, please. And so, uh, as Ian mentioned, we we've, we've been able to increase our state level work, our state level advocacy, um, and, and the geolocation of the schools that we include in the database allows us to to quickly um, collate state level lists. Uh, previously, we because of limited bandwidth, we had only been able to do state level pools upon request or when needed. Uh, they would often be requested by legislators who are who were drafting or developing um, legislation for state level bans, or by journalists who may have been covering uh, those efforts, or even journalists simply interested in, in learning the the breadth of the issue um, in their state. Uh, and then we would also pull them when needed uh, after that legislation is passed and, and enacted. Uh, more recently, we've been able to proactively compile and update these lists uh, for each state, uh, and, and we're currently over, over 20 states completed. Uh, I've included here a couple of lists, Ohio and Washington, and, and again, these are only some of the mascots, so don't expect the, the totals to, to necessarily add up. Um, Ohio specifically, we pulled to help inform uh, our discussion with the, the Cleveland Indians Major League Baseball franchise. Uh, ahead of their decision to retire their mascot last December. Um, as you can see, Ohio, uh, these mascots are quite popular there, um, despite lacking a, a federally recognized tribal nation within the state. Um, almost 200 schools in total still, still employing these mascots. Um, Washington, we, we used that list uh, after they recently passed their state level mascot ban, uh, signed into law by Governor Inslee just a few months ago. Um, and this list we were able to use to compare with one prepared by their office of the superintendent of public instruction. And when comparing and contrasting those lists, we actually found a couple of schools that we weren't unaware of and a couple of schools that they were unaware of. Um, and so it helps inform both sides uh, as this legislation is, is enacted and, and moves forward. Uh, we are also working closely with, with the Colorado Commission of Indian Affairs uh, and we'll be meeting with them later this week to discuss their recently passed uh, mascot ban legislation that is awaiting the, the governor's signature there. Next slide, please. So the current, uh, the current numbers, um, you know, a little bit more detail on this. The, uh, this is just a quick snapshot of, of the, the depth and breadth of our engagement um, and the depth and breadth of activity on this issue over the past a uh, year or two. Um, 250 plus, that's the number of school districts that NCI has individually engaged using this database tool since, since May of last year, so just about 13 months. Um, the number of schools that we've engaged with uh, that have proceeded to retire their native theme mascots is, stands at 56, and that's so far. We're still actively engaged with a number of school districts on an ongoing fashion um, to kind of help them get across the finish line. Several of these schools um, have uh, votes upcoming. Um, you know, we've, we've, we see a sort of a natural ebb and flow with this where um, school boards tend to make these sort of big picture decisions over the summer months. So, and typically towards, you know, July, August, early September is when they tend to schedule and make votes on things like this. Um, the total number of school changes in 2020 was 70 and um, school changes thus far that we've accounted for in 2021 and stands at 20. And again, we expect that number to rise significantly between now and the end of the year. Next slide. So we, we also wanted to include here some of the, the recent school mascot changes. Uh, we included two schools here on the left side of the screen, uh, Opamis and Susquehanna Township in Michigan and Pennsylvania, respectively. Both of these schools retired their native themed mascots last month. 
Um, chairperson payment was, was instrumental in discussions in OPMIS um, and helping inform them, uh, inform those discussions and push that decision across the finish line. Um, so thank you to chairperson payment. Um, and we also included on the right side there, uh, a couple of high schools that retired their mascots last July and have already installed not only new mascot names, but new mascot imagery to give you an idea of just how quickly that process can evolve. Um, importantly, both of these schools also uh, include, these new mascots are use the same color schemes as their previous mascots, uh, which helps ease that transition, not only in the community, but, but the costs of, of that transition as well. Um, Anderson, an important note, uh, we are still in contact with one of their school board members who, who has become a, a great ally in this process. Um, and she notified us that they have already raised more than $300,000 within the community to help aid in the mascot change. Uh, those costs will always vary across school, across district, across states. Um, and it depends how, just how integrated that mascot is at the school. Um, but but $300,000, obviously a very, a very significant amount of money raised there. Next slide, please. So in closing, we just wanted to let you know how you can find out more information uh, about the database. Um, if you go to our uh, newly expanded and updated Proud to Be webpage, which is where we house all of our information on the mascot issue and NCI's work on it, uh, you can go to ncai.org slash proud to be. And you can also email us at mascots at nci.org if you wish to be um, if you wish to be added to our mascots email listserv, or if you have any uh, additional questions about the database that we aren't able to answer in the, in the remaining time we have with you today. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Yvette. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for that really uh, great presentation. It's so exciting to be able to accurately track uh, all of this information for advocacy purposes, but I know this kind of an effort is a huge amount of work with several staff. So thank you guys for all your hard work on this great resource. And it is also so great to see that things are finally changing and we can actually track it. So thank you. Um, we do have time for questions. Please write your questions in the chat box and we'll get to as many as possible. All right, let's see. The first question is from Deborah Lakanoff. Um, thank you, Ian, for all your help in Washington State. We have had three schools in Washington State change their native mascot name upon the request of the nearest federally recognized tribes in their district. This is a comment, but do you have any uh, comments around that? Well, I want to salute. Uh, I want to salute Representative uh, Lekhanov for for her uh, hard work on this issue. Um, as some of you may know, she sponsored the legislation in Washington that. Uh, that it, that instituted the ban on uh, race our, our native theme mascots in Washington State, and um, you know there there is a provision in there that enables schools, if they so wish, to retain their mascots to engage with the nearest tribe in an effort to retain them, um, and there, you know agreement has to be reached. And um, we're working closely with with uh, Representative Lekanoff and and um, the state level uh, Indian instruction partners there. Uh, on on making sure that both the tribal leadership in those tribes in the state, as well as the school leadership among those schools in the state, are fully educated about the issue about where any country writ large stands on it, and also about the importance that schools engage in in you know proper consultation in accordance with the law as they as they work to either retire and, or, or retain these mascots. Great. The next question is from Derek Montroy. Thank you for your work, two exclamation points. Is it possible to get an updated list with the schools in New York State with if they have retired their mascot or not? I'll, I'll defer to Kobe on this because I think he wants to explain a little bit more about how accessible this database is. Yeah, yes, uh, absolutely. So the database itself um, is not yet available for, for public use. Um, but, but as mentioned, we can do state level polls. And so we, we absolutely could do a, a New York state level poll itself. Um, and we also have, even though the database is not publicly available, we do have a, a mascot database one pager that we update uh, at least bi-weekly, if not, if not um, even more, even, even more often. Um, 
and, and that is available online as well. Yeah, and it's our ultimate goal. It's our ultimate goal to have this online and, and publicly searchable. There's just a there as you as you may have seen from the earlier slides, there's just an immensity of information that uh, we have to keep updated and figure out if we do make it publicly available, how we how we sync that up with an online platform. Thank you. The next question is, um, how can people get in touch with NCAI regarding concerns about schools with native themed mascots? Yeah, you can you can email the mascots at nci.org or you can email um, any of our team members, myself or Kobe or Ashley. Um, our, um, I, I'll leave it to you, Yvette, see if you can squeeze in our email addresses before the end of our session here. But um, you know, this is how we this is how we deploy the database. We will get inquiries via typically via email, um, saying, "Hey, you know, we've got this mascot. The school board seems unwilling to um, unwilling to relinquish the mascot in part because they say, well, native people aren't really offended by it. I don't see a lot of native people coming to us saying they have a problem with it. And you know, Kobe showed Ohio has close to 200 school mascots in a state with no federally recognized tribes. And most of those school communities have very few native students in those schools. And so that's not, that's not so a surprise if you don't have a lot of uh, native people, uh, um, you know, claiming opposition to these mascots. So it's incredibly powerful when you see a national organization with the weight of NCI, the number of tribal nations represented in the Congress and the number of uh, native people that those tribal nations uh, constitute um, coming to a local school community and saying, we are in consensus on this issue and we have been for more than 50 years. And here's what we feel about them. These do not honor Native people. And we, we want you guys to understand the ramifications of your, your um, seeming you know, reluctance to get rid of this. Great. Um, the next question is by Robert McGee. Is there a listing of how many schools in each state? I went to the link that was provided. Uh, yeah, as again, as mentioned, we, we do have those state level lists uh, and we can send them to um, anybody upon request. We're still working to compile those lists, uh, but do have about 20, a little more than 20 states currently accounted for. Um, and, and are working to to have all 50 accounted for within the next few weeks uh, so that we could more easily send those polls out. And, and importantly, each state is organized by mascot name and then by district. And so it, it allows for a real uh, easily digestible breakdown of the mascots in the state. The last question is from Lindsay Candy. What percentage of these school districts are predominantly white? or ethnicities other than native? I mean, it's hard, it's hard to say with any level of specificity. I think anecdotally, um, the, the majority, the vast majority of these school districts are predominantly populated by white students or, um, and, and will have typically very low concentrations of uh, students of color and certainly of native students. I'll, I'll just add, we have noticed um, you know, obviously, I, I agree with, with Ian's assessment, but in, in some Western states, we have noticed that, especially Montana and Idaho, um, a lot of the school districts employing these mascots are actually on reservation uh, or on, on tribal land. And so obviously, the, the populations at, at those schools is, is a little different. Okay, great. Thank you. And we do have a comment from... Um, Chairperson Aaron Payment, he just wants to let the audience know that we need tribal leaders and community members to team up to adopt a school and make the change. When we speak, they have to listen. Too often tribes are not engaging and the schools take this for granted. Most school superintendents are supportive once you invoke their professional ethics, but they need our help. And I know um, Chairperson Payment's been a a uh, great advocate in this and has had much success as well, some good outcomes. Well, those are all the time we have for questions today. I am so grateful for your presentation. Thanks so much, Ian and Kobe. And uh, maybe we can drop their email addresses or the mascot um, email address in the chat. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.